I just want to say to um, everybody who's connected with the center how honored I am to be here with you. I watched um, on the web um, Kim's presentation, and she talked about how she got into this work. And she got into this work as an educator and as a psychologist. I got into this work in part, I'm a sociologist who did some education, but I got into this work pretty late, and I got into this, uh, this specific work pretty late. But, but I want to tell you why it became important to me. I got into this work because if we had done the things that were in that movie when I was in my um, early adolescence, I probably wouldn't have supported bullying. I wasn't a bully. In fact, they come to people's rescue. But at the same time, I, I realized and have realized for a while the extent to which I participated in bullying. If I had been educated in this way when I started with many other people worldwide, or joined with them, I should say, in fighting for social justice in the anti-war and civil rights movements in the US, I think I would have been a lot more effective because of the fact that I could have better understood how different people behaved. I remember back in 1960, in, in 1988, there was a meeting of the graduate students in the history department who had been in the buildings at Columbia in 1968 when I was chairman of the graduate history department. And there was a guy there who's now very, very famous. And I remember thinking he was pretty weird when he was a, an undergraduate and I was a graduate student. Um, he talked about the fact that he, in retrospect, he was the only Puerto Rican student at Columbia College in 1968. If I was the only Puerto Rican student at Columbia College in 1968, I might have acted pretty weird, too. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I was socially conscious, racially conscious, but I was not in my 20s, even though I was an effective political organizer, aware of that is something that if people had really educated me a little more, maybe I could have been. And maybe I could have been more effective. And if I think about my 30s and my 40s, when I was a pretty good father, both to a kid we had by birth as well as to um, two kids that we adopted who came with greater levels of need but great, great specialness. I could have been a lot more patient. I could have been a lot more helpful to my wife and partner in life if, again, I had been educated and re-educated so that I could take advantage of my brightness and my hyperactivity but also control my reactivity in different ways. Um, and I'll go on. I, I'm not going to go on, but I could say as I now am at a point where I am privileged to be a grandfather of seven you know, wonderful grandkids, and I still now teach myself the stuff that we want to teach other people and get better at it, I really appreciate how important it is for us as a community, whether it is here, whether it is in the United States, whether it is in Bangladesh or Cambodia, to really be providing young people and their families and their communities with the opportunities not only to want to do good, but to be able to do good. And that's what this stuff is really about. And so what I'm going to do is try to provide all of us with a common base so that then when Maria and I talk and then when you join in, we can talk together. And while I am here as the broad in expert, and I'm very happy to be here. I love Vancouver, even though the, not the weather this time. But I'm here because I want to learn from and with you. This, one of the questions that I was asked for either today or tomorrow is, is this a movement? And in a piece, it is a movement. And it's a movement that involves all of us. And it's a movement that involves all of us, not because of the fact that there's a theme. It's because I think we all know that we're incomplete if we're not able to be good, to extend our heart, to reach out, to embrace more people. So let's start with some challenges. And you can think about how relevant they are around us. Um, some overarching issues. Amongst kids in this world, increasing exposure to trauma, not less exposure, but increasing. Hyperstimulation. It's a function of all the wonderful technologies we have and a lot of other things. But people really are stimulated so much. Um, along with it, the reinforcement of short-term rewards. The quicker my computer gets, the more impatient I am for the fact that the search engine is not really moving as fast as my brain, I think. Um, speeded up lives. A 
and the absence of adult supervision. And it's speeded up lives, whether people are yuppies who are so involved in their lives or people who are struggling to do things. But people are doing more and more, which gives them less and less time to be together and to really connect. Um, and then a great opportunity, but what's also a great challenge, is that more and more interactions amongst people who are diverse. And at the same time, and this drives some of that interaction, is both internal migration and external migration. I led an evaluation for UNICEF of its child-friendly schools. It was a global evaluation, and at the end they said, what are the five things we should think about in the next five years? And I said, trauma, trauma, trauma. And I said, you know why you're going to have more trauma? Because just think about the impacts of global warming. And just think about what global warming does in terms of pushing people to other places. People have been traumatized and then are bumping into other places. And at the same time when they said, what do we have to think about and where can we go? And I said, social emotional learning. Because that's one of the things, it's not the only thing that we can do to help people who have been impacted by tra trauma, whose ability to self-regulate, whose ability to connect with others is compromised by that to be able to do things. And some specific manifestations of the challenges. Bullying. I know that's a real issue in Canada. It's a real issue in my family, and I can tell you because I got permission from my, my daughter-in-law. Um, one of my grandchildren right now is really struggling with it, and three of my seven over the last two years have been bullied. Um, disparities as they're related to implicit biases, and I'll talk about that later. Um, explosive and what... Uh, and, and there's a missing here, it, it's eschatological aggression. And what I really mean, though scatological is actually very interesting, but that's not what I meant, <laughs> is I'm actually very much an activist. And I think it is fine if people in control of their lives make strategic decisions. They still should weigh them morally, but they shouldn't be propelled and out of control by their anger. They should let that anger fuel their strategic thinking. And what we often have in the type of terror that worries us is people who are fueled by anger and are doing things that are not in anybody's strategic interest, including themselves. And that may be scatological, but it definitely is eschatological. OK, so I want to. Overview SEL, and I'm going to do it very quickly because you can see this later. And there's going to be two sets of slides because I wanted to tell you what are some examples for kids and then um, how can we measure. I'm not going to give you the measurements because we can talk about that later. But let's start by what is social, what is social emotional learning. And that's for those of you who did not hear Kim. Um, it's a process for helping children and adults develop the basic skills necessary for a safe and happy life. You know, it's a nutrient that we really want to have people get. SEL teaches the skills that we need to handle ourselves, our relationships, and our work effectively and ethically. And the way I think about it, it's not just teaching us the skills, it's building the competencies. It's building things that will help us develop even new skills. Now, there's an organization that some of you have heard about and others should call CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic and Social and Emotional Learning. And they represent a variety of people who themselves may conceptualize SEL in a slightly different way. But together, there's a common definition, and I want to use that. It's the same one Kim did so that we can really be consistent. And it really talks about five things. I don't care where we start, but self-management, self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills, and the ability to make responsible decisions. So let's look at them quickly. Um, being self-aware, having the ability to accurately assess your feelings, your interests, your values, and your strengths. And if you think about it, this happens in different ways as kids and adults become, get older. The ability to maintain a well-grounded sense of self-confidence. Well-grounded, not overly optimistic, not overly pessimistic. And here I'll give you the examples to think about, but I'm not going to do it in the other cases. We can see it by, by examining whether or not kids can recognize and actually label simple emotions, such as being sad, anger, happiness. Analyze factors that, that kids can analyze factors that trigger those str their own stress reactions. And that they have the ability to analyze how various expressions of emotion on their part affect other people. You know, those rolling eyes, maybe? Those things that we do to people whom we love, but we 
we still are not so self-aware ourselves. One way of talking about it, and um, a colleague of ours named Mark Brackett talks about it, is, is emotional literacy. The ability to recognize, to understand, to label, express, and to regulate those emotions. And, and I may talk later with Maria, and she asked for this. We can think about a mood media. So how are you right now? Um, how are you feeling? I hope you're over here. This is where I want you to be. But when you're outside, you might have been here. What's your level of energy? Um, I hope you're about here. But it's a, being self-aware and being able to adjust yourself if you need to adjust yourself. You know, I, I'm, I've been interested, in, but have not studied the phenomenon that when the weather is worse and when cars are least safe, that's when people are much more, less likely to, more likely to be in the road getting in trouble. And what they are not aware of is how their own reaction to the environment is placing them in an unsafe circumstance. OK, so how about self-management? It's the ability to regulate your emotions, to handle stress, to control impulses, to persevere in overcoming obstacles. Think about that in terms of those academic data you heard about before. The way you succeed, unless you really are, and I had a kid who was like that, I know my no brain son who could almost do everything right, but the way you succeed is by getting up when you get frustrated, not giving up the first time or the second time or the hundredth time. Um, the ability to set and monitor progress towards personal and academic goals, and the ability to express emotions appropriately. Let's go back for a second. Stroke of hands. Have any of you heard about the marshmallow express, uh, experiment? Yeah, right. And you can see it on YouTube. But if we think about the data there that the kids who gave up the candy, the marshmallows, the chocolate for uh, just a few minutes because they knew they'd get two were the ones who were more likely a decade or two later to go to college. Now, that's not genetic. And you know what? That can be changed. And we can change that through social emotional learning so people have a better ability to wait for that second marshmallow. Um, and the ability to express your emotions appropriately. How about being self-aware? Self the ability to take the perspective of others and empathize with others. Think about me, callow me when I'm 20 years old and organizing. Um, the ability to recognize and appreciate individual and group similarities and differences. Everybody is different. Everybody also may share things in common. Can we manage to balance both of those? And the ability to recognize and use family and school resources to help you. You know, there's studies of in what people call invulnerable, very resilient young people. And the famous one is that the first one came out of Kauai. And what's interesting when you look at the study is the fact that the kids who were resilient were the kids who were able to find somebody who would mentor or help them. And it's a combination of your awareness to find the right person and also probably the personal and social skills to make sure that the right person wants to be the right person for you. So resilience is not just based in the individual, though it, it has that individual competency. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through the demonstrations. These are emotional cards. It comes from a good um, intervention but developed in part by Mark Greenberg, who I think has also talked here. It's called PATHS. I'm right now studying it being implemented to scale in, uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. And one of the things that young people do is to learn to take a card to express how they feel. Um, so that they are more conscious of the fact that there's more to being um, unhappy than being sad. You might be confused. You might be afraid. You might be mad. And it's also the ability to express it to others. And when you go to schools in Cleveland, the teachers, as well as the chief academic officer, as well as the, the CEO, who's the superintendent, actually wear their card on how they're feeling, because it's important. Um, the ability to have good relationships, to establish and maintain healthy and rewarding relationships based on cooperation, not intimidation. The ability to resist inappropriate social pressure. Um, the best thing, probably the luckiest thing in my life is in, when I was 15 and fell in love with my wife on a blind date, 
And one day before we met, the people who set it up said, you don't want to go out with her. She wears glasses and she's studious. I was a wannabe at the time. And I was lucky because in spite of not having social emotional learning, I was able to resist peer pressure. And my life would have been profoundly different if I didn't. But not everyone would be as lucky as I am, and which is why we want to give people the ability to be able to make good choices and not make bad choices. And the ability to you know, do things to prevent, manage, and resolve interpersonal conflict. And when you need help to do what we learn to do and ask for that help. Now, we don't often talk about SEL and cultural competence, but I, want to do, I do want to talk about that a little. And first I want to say from my own work as well as others, but I've done work now in about 12 different countries, and one of the things I always do is I start out by talking to people about what are their aspirations for their kids. And after we talk, I then give them think, the model that comes from Castle, and then I say, how relevant is this to you? And we keep on finding out that it is very relevant. They may change it a little, but it has a resonance. And so I think what we have in this model is not the perfect language, but it resonates with things that are part of the species. And they're expressed differently in different cultures, and they can be developed differently, but they really are common. But at the same time, I think it's very important to address a major problem in our world, including in Canada. And it's a problem of bias, and particularly implicit bias. Let me give you an example. It comes from the east, so you can say, not here, but you can sit t test out yourself whether it's in BC as well. I was an expert witness in a case that I will not des I will describe the context and information, but not the specifics, before the um, Ontario Human Rights Commission. It's a case where an African-Canadian African kid was removed from school under manacles for fighting when she was involved in a play fight. There was no real fight. And the reason I know there was no real fight was that after I testified, I saw a video. And the video was the kids in the big atrium. And when the kids were play fighting, no other adolescent in that school was looking. And I've never seen any, right, you got it. If there was a fight, people would have been watching. But there were people watching. There were people upstairs who were watching on a TV camera. And they saw a situation that was ambiguous. And they unconsciously, because they were probably good people, let their own implicit bias get in the way. And what they acted out was something that has been studied experimentally over 20 times by social psychologists. And it is about the process of implicit bias. And it's about the process that you watch the media, you get primed, here you see some African-Canadian kids. And lo and behold, when you are in an ambiguous situation, and this was ambiguous, you tend to see it that way. I don't know if any of you saw on YouTube, I think it's made it, but there's this case of two people, one steal, both acting as if they're stealing, taking a bike. One is a, an African-American guy who's well-dressed, and everyone immediately is coming to go at him. And I think he was saying it was his bike. And then there is a pretty sweet blonde young woman. And not only is no one worrying that she's stealing things, everyone's coming to say, can I help you? Now, it's not that people are aware of it, but these are things that are going on. And what I think social emotional learning can help people do, young people as well as adults, is be more aware of how we develop biases in spite of our aspirations so that we can be on top of them. Um, this is a picture about those face cards. I'm in it, but it, it's because we, it, I only had a video and not that. What's really important here, and this is from Bangladesh, is the way they've adapted using the, the cards is for these kids to express publicly your emotions is to do something that you normally don't do. And yet people feel to be able to be successful, it's important. And so kids will get up and declare, I feel happy today because, or I feel sad today because. So I want to go a little more about SEL and cultural competence. Um, 
the cultural competence has been well operationalized and studied in the US, and I have a website here of a center that I lead that can talk about it, but I want you to think about this in terms of SEL. The ability to value diversity, the capacity to self-assess. That's what those competencies are about. To be conscious of the dynamics of what happens when cultures interact. The willingness to engage in professional development and coaching to get better and the ability to change your behavior in a way that reflects an understanding of the diversity between and among people and cultures. And while one can train people, and people have done this for many years, I think doing the workshops and not dealing with the underlying platform underneath in terms of people's heads, in terms of their own self-awareness, in terms of their own ability to say, you know, I have a bias and I can deal with that bias by controlling it, limits the impact of the cultural competency work that's been done in the US. And going back to that whole set, the ability to make responsible decisions based on consideration of ethical standards, safety concerns, appropriate norms, respect for others, and the likely consequences of various actions. These will be culturally specific, but it's still to make good decisions. And the ability to apply those to schools and learning and to contribute to your school and to your community. Um, and I think this is the same data you've seen before, so I'm not going over, but I think the main thing to know is if you look at the top, which is a 23 percentile difference, that's on social competence. That's what the SEL programs were targeting. That's a much bigger impact, but the important th other thing is that that 11 percent impact that's right here is about the same level of impact that we find for most academic programs that are evidence-based. Those are modest impacts, but they really are important. So why SEL? It's important to life success, both individually, but also relationally, and how we behave affects other people. It's important to self-school success. Again, individually, it's my ability to persevere, my ability to become a self-motivated learner, but it's also collectively what I do in a group, how my behavior affects the teacher that affects what she, he does with other kids and vice versa. It's about doing more good and more healthy things and about avoiding bad and unhealthy things like implicit bias, but like smoking or like unsafe sex. Um, you know that we, we know from lots of research on things like binge drinking that you can really educate college students that binge drinking is bad, and, and they know it. And then you ask them whether, how many times they binge drunk in the last three weeks, and you find out that there's very little relationship. We do great training about not just that you should use condoms. You know, we have people who actually call themselves, I'm the condom guy, you know, I come in here, we do it. It's one thing to know about using condoms. It's another thing to execute the condoms when your hormones are rushing and everything's going on. And SEL is about building the competence to execute. It's also going back to, it's not just skills, it's creating portable assets in an evolving world. The world that everyone is gonna face in 10 years is not the world that it is right now. We're gonna to have to keep on creating. It's about making values real. I, I preach all the time to my, you know, that I'm now a grandfather, so I really can. But that moral education without giving people the ability to execute it is not effective education. SEL is not moral education. I mean, I actually think that psychopaths could even get better through social emotional learning. We still want to have moral education. But moral education without SEL is not going to move us very, very far. It's about building resilience, and it's about enabling people who are in recovery to recover more effectively, whether or not it's substance abuse recovery or whether or not it's recovery from some type of chronic illness. It's about creating emotionally literate and competent adults who can raise the next generation of kids in a way that maybe they will become earlier more emotionally competent. And it's about those same emotionally competent adults collaborating to work together to create a just world. To not 
give up anger, and I don't know if that fits here in the Dalai Lama Center at injustice, but I think we should be angry at injustice, but we shouldn't dwell on the anger. We should let that anger fuel us, make us even more intentional, make us even more compassionate to create a just world. And what it's about, as I end right now, is thriving and flourishing and well-being. Now, let me just say one more thing about lessons I've learned. Um, when my two kids, who are now thriving, came to us after lots of challenges from the forced care system and experienced lots of other challenges as the US system did not work well for them, I used to say what I wanted to do was at least help them survive, help them get to when they were 20, 22 and things could then be better. Now, we know, now know much more about brain science that 22 is not the right age. We'd have to wait a little longer for the prefrontal cortex to fix, <laughs> right? But what's more important is survival is not what we want for people. Survival is not a good life. It's better than the alternative, but it's not a good life. What we want are people who flourish, who thrive and who can help other people flourish and thrive. And social-emotional learning and developing social-emotional competencies is part of that. So I thank you for listening to me. And now I'll have much more fun with Maria and with you. So.